With that, I'd like to take now the time to introduce our keynote speaker, Tommy Edison. Tommy Edison has been blind since birth and is now producing videos online that reveal a glimpse into his life and the funny challenges that he faces daily. He created the Tommy Edison Experience web series, which features him using humor to answer the most popular questions about living without sight. The channel was launched on October 10, 2011 and is available to watch on Amazon and YouTube. Tommy is living the dream of reviewing movies as the blind film critic. With his unique and interesting perspective, Tommy says, quote, I watch movies and pay attention to them in a different way than sighted people do. I'm not distracted by all the beautiful shots and attractive people. I watch a movie for the writing and acting. In addition to being blind, the blind film critic, Tommy has been a radio professional for nearly 25 years, having spent the last 19 years at Star 99.9 FM in Connecticut as a traffic reporter. Tommy's engaging personality, along with his on-air excellence and entertaining demeanor, has garnered him much media attention. Please welcome to the stage, Tommy Edison. Oh, here. Hi. Oh, this works. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be here. Thank you to um, Ken and everybody uh, here at Utah JS for having me. It's, it's a thrill to be here. Um, and yeah, so we're just going to talk for a little while and tell some stories and things about life before accessibility and then life with accessibility. Because when I was coming up, that word didn't even exist. So I'm 100, right? I was born in... <laughs> I am. I'm like, I'm older than your parents, most of you. Which is horrible, but I, I met this, well, I got to think, you know, I met this guy named Tejas today, who we, we met at Brecky, and uh, I need I needed to have the shirt ironed, and I was like, can you, you know, because somebody at the hotel give me a hand with this, and he was actually nice enough to do it, so big up Tejas, everybody, he, it was awesome, give him some, go on, give him some love, and then yesterday, can I tell you just one nutty story yesterday real quick? I, so I, I, didn't, I was not here for the speaker's dinner last night. And it, it broke my heart. But I, I had the worst Uber experience in the world yesterday. So I live in Connecticut. I live about, um, about on, like on a good day, about an hour, hour, 10 minutes from the New York airports, from LaGuardia and JFK and stuff. So I called for, you know, I had a 1025 board, 1125 takeoff. <laughs> 845 ought to do it, right? That should work. This goofy, oh my God, she stopped along the way to, to pick up her license. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I wanted to go to Dunkin' Donuts for Brecky, and there was no time, it was like nine o'clock already. I'm like, you know what, screw, we'll just blow off Dunkin' Donuts. And then like 20 minutes later, she stops to get gas and wants to go to Dunkin' Donuts for me. I'm like, no, I have to get this plane. So I'm sorry I missed you all last night, but here we are today. So yeah, my name is Tommy Edison. I am known as the Blind Film Critic on YouTube. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about my radio, um, my radio work for a little bit as well. We'll talk about just growing up as a blind kid and then how um, accessibility changed my life, really. Um, and made giant things happen for me that I'd never even dreamed possible. So, and some of this, you know, some of this stuff is great, and some of it's scary and sad, and you know, I don't want to, you know, hit the, uh, the, what is it, the con, uh, what is it called, conduct, point of con, whatever it was. Anyway, I was going to curse, I was going to use a word, but, um, but yeah, but some of it's sort of scary and sort of. But so here we go. So I grew up in a place called Greenwich, Connecticut, which is just outside of New York City. It's a very fancy neighborhood, although it wasn't for us. <laughs> you could say, no, seriously, Greenwich is very fans. But we, you know, you could see my parents' house from the street, you know what I mean? It was a little embarrassing. <laughs> we didn't even have a tennis court growing up, you know what I mean? It was tough. Every day is a struggle, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but it, you know, so that was how I grew up. I have three sisters, and my parents, my mom and dad, really wanted me to do all the stuff that the other kids were doing. So I learned how to ride bikes as a kid, and I rode around the neighborhood a little bit and stuff, and... You know, it was one of those where people parked on the street and everything, so I was sort of bumping the cars and stuff, but I was going slowly enough so that it never really did any damage, you know, but, and it was always sort of fast, well, would you look at the blind kid on a bike, how do you like that, huh? Isn't that fascinating? Um, you know, and, and school too, my, my mom really fought hard for me to get into the public school systems in, in, in Greenwich, um, and like, they didn't want me. 
they wanted to put me in the special class, which is back then, in, in these days, the special class was sort of an amalgamation of kids with all kinds of different disability, from you know, maybe dyslexia or something you know, as simple as that, all the way up to you know, maybe like Down syndrome or something like this, right? It, it ran the gamut. And so they wanted to put me in this class. <laughs> My mother was like, no, he's, his cognition's fine. He's cogn you know, he just can't see, that's all. And so she fought and fought and fought and got me into the school system, and it was great. Um, but, you know, growing up, I grew up alone a lot. I mean, in a sense, right? Because there was no other kids like me. I didn't see, there's two kinds of blind people in the world. There are those of us who've been mainstreamed. And what that means is you go to all the public schools and do everything the sighted kids do. Or the other kind of blind people have not been mainstreamed. And they go to blind schools. And as a result, it's so funny because people like myself who've gone through the, the public schools, I don't really know any blind people. I just don't. Um, and funny enough, the blind people that have gone to the blind schools don't really know sighted people, nor do they trust them. Um, yeah, so I know, it's strange, right? But so that's, you know, so my family wanted me to do all the stuff that all the other kids were doing. So uh, that's what I did. And one of the things I did was sort of grow up alone. And another thing I did was try and fit in. That was what my whole life was all about, was trying to fit in. And nobody told me I couldn't, right? So. <laughs> I just figured I could do anything that the other kids were doing because that's how I'd be raised. And so I went to school, and school was a little bit different for me. Again, so there's no accessibility, right? So what I had to do in public school, in grammar school, was do all my work in Braille. Everything was on the Perkins Brailler, okay? And then they brought in a woman who would come and transcribe my work, not translate, friends, transcribe. Well, that's a big mistake. People, oh, can I translate that from Braille for you? I'm like, no, it's English. It's still English. <laughs> Right? But it is. But so, no, transcribe. And so what she would do is write over my work in print and then hand it back to the teacher. And then the teacher could just, you know, put the F on it and give it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that was how school worked. That, you know, that was how it worked. And I didn't, you know, funny, when I was a kid, when I was a little kid, like five, six years old, I heard the radio. I heard rock and roll music and I heard the radio. And I fell in love with both of them at the same time. And I knew as a five, six year old kid that that's, I either want to be a pop star or a disc jockey. Because people on radio sounded like they were having so much fun and they were playing all the hits and everything. So it sounded like the greatest job in the world. So at six, I knew what I wanted to do. I did. Like, you know, when the sighted kids wanted to be cowboys and cops and firemen and all that kind of thing and the girls were nurses and ballerinas and the whole, right? No, I want to be a rock and roll disc jockey or a rock and roll star, like a musician, you know? Um, and so that, that was what I sort of did. And so I went through school kind of bored and, because I already knew. I already knew what I wanted to do. So school was dull. I hated it. I couldn't see the point of doing a report, making a, doing a term paper, bibliography, none of this stuff. Geometry, what do we need this for? Ah, phenomenal. We don't, all that means is go to Naples, by the way, for code of conduct. <laughs> phenomenal. They used to say it on Sopranos all the time. Silly used to say it. Um, but yeah, so that was, you know, that was what I kind of did. And, I fell in love, so school was boring, and I, I didn't do very well in public school. So I then went into the private school system. I, I, I left public school and went to a private school in Connecticut and went there for a couple of years, and it was great. And I got more music training and you know, actually got to do <laughs> a bit of work. But the funny thing about that school was I didn't have a, a teacher anymore to go over my work, so I had to do all my work on a typewriter, right? Because I didn't graduate high school until 1981, so it's the 70s. There's no computers, there's nothing. So um, I'm doing my Spanish work on a typewriter. With, yeah, he knows, this guy knows. With no tilde, no accents, no nothing. No, you know, that backwards question mark at the beginning of the sentence, none of it. I didn't have any of that stuff. So as a result, I got C's in Spanish. I got C's. Now, my Spanish is great, and I was a good speaker and everything like that. But because the, the homework was bad, I got, I got docked for it. And I, I went to my 20-year reunion. And, and this guy was still alive, Mr. Vio. Jules Vio was his name. And I said, I got a, you know, I got a bone to pick with you, sir. He goes, what is it, Thomas? I said, look, Spanish. I was always so good in class. I was always this. And I could speak and I could do all these stuff. And all you ever do is give me a C. Why didn't you say anything, Thomas? I don't know. I'm a kid. I'm in high school. Well, I'm not going to talk to a teacher. Hey, you should have said something. You got, you got beaten in that class. I'm sorry. I was like, wow. So, you know, but like you're a kid and you're 16, 17, you know, you don't want to cause any trouble and ruffle feathers and stuff. So, you know, I didn't and took the C and that was it. So that, that, that was school. But then 
you know, I went through school and I was playing, I was doing a lot of music stuff. I was playing, you know, um, I was a bass student in high school and college for that matter. Um, played a bunch of other things too, the harmonica and guitar and drums and percussion and some other things and sang a little bit. Um, and then, so that's what I sort of did through college. And then I got a job as an intern at a radio station. So the whole time this, the radio dream is still alive. And I'm telling you what, it, an internship is the best. It is the greatest thing in the world. It did so many things for me. One, it gave me stuff that wasn't in any book, right? Stuff that's not in any book in the world. Two, I was around two working radio stations all the time, around disc jockeys, around people, just the whole thing. Here I am. <laughs> and they just, you know, I worked in the newsroom and I helped them to gather sound and stuff. And the other thing that interning helped me do, or help, really helped them do, was to get used to me. You see? So people get to know me as an intern. They're not paying me, you know? And I'm just running around the radio station doing whatever I can do just to help out, you know? And as a result, things began to happen for me. I first, you know... My voice appeared on a commercial, you know, saying like, you know, open Saturday and Sunday until five, you know, and that, what a thrill, you know, to hear yourself on the radio. I was like, wow, here we go. And a, another thing, a, a guy let me do a segue for him, which simply means, that, you know, when the next record, end, when the one record ends to start the next one. And it's one of those things that nobody would ever know, but I did it and it was a thrill. It was so much fun. So things are starting to happen. I'm getting to be on like some more commercials and things, and you know, I'm still I'm still working for free, but I'm cool. And, like it's you know, I'm learning. I'm just learning, learning, learning. And the program director of the FM radio station, the jazz station, comes up to me and says, "Listen, I got a, I got a problem." I said, "What's up, Skip?" He said, "Look, my midday person's going on mat leave. She's pregnant. She's pregnant, right? So the overnight girl's going to do middays. I need somebody to do overnights. Would you want to do it?" I said, uh, "Yeah, totes, my goats, yeah." <laughs> So, <laughs> for the kids, but um, <laughs> I'm still with it, man. I still, you know, I still know what's going on. <laughs> Kidding me? Pan Amsterdam, everybody. I love him. Anybody know who that is? Nobody. He's a great rapper. He's very cool, and the kids wouldn't like him, but he's great. But anyway, so here we go. So he's given me this opportunity. So now, like, you know what's funny when you daydream? You, know, you think of the front, you think of where you are now, and then you think of the other side, but you don't think of all the middle bits. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to make this stuff happen? So it's a Thursday afternoon. He says this to me. He's like, I'm not going to be back until Monday, so you know, let me know. I said, okay. So I went home. So I'm, I'm still living at my mom's house at this time because I'm making no money. And um, you know, I was like, okay. So in radio, what they do is they give you a playlist of the, all the records that you're gonna play each hour. So there's, you know, 12 an hour, right? So that's, you know, 72 tunes, easy enough. And all I need is title, artist, track number, and disc number, okay? Easy, so I can get somebody at the house to read me those. Next, the compact discs are on a wall behind me, just in slots, just boop, 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 all the way up and down in rows of 64. So Tommy learns how to count by 64 quick, right? Because now you got to have landmarks and things, right? So it's 1 to 64, 65 to 128, 129 to 192, 193 to 257, and so on and so forth. I could do that all day. Um, and so that was helpful to grab and put away you know, the, the CDs. Next, the weather, that's easy enough. Bright sunshine, I had the high near 83 today. Clear tonight, down to 60. And for tomorrow, more sun and clouds, and then near 82. Done. <laughs> then the commercials are the only thing left. And I've got a Braille machine at the radio station, too. So I can just have the jack on before me. Tell me what they are. It's midnight till six. There's going to be like maybe two in the midnight hour and one in the five. That's it. And that was how I learned how to do. That was how I made a completely print room accessible, totally print, and I made it work for me. See, there was no accessibility, nothing, nothing. Now, I'm doing this job for a while. It's close to my house. It's easy enough to get to. I can take cabs there, or somebody from my family can come and grab me, or whatnot. Oh, I hate that word. Forgive me for using it. It's not a real word at all. Whatnot, just in case. Um, it's not. It's not a real word. But um, so, you know, as things happen in radio, they change. And so now I have to look for another job. This job is going away. So I get a call from a guy who actually put me on the radio when I was in Stanford, Connecticut, as a traffic reporter. And he said, I need a traffic guy. And I said, OK. So I went up to interview with him. Now, here's the problem. Remember the first radio station? I interned, right? So everybody knew me. They were all used to me. So when I started working there, it was no big deal. Now I'm going to a completely new radio station. I have to convince these people that it's going to be okay to have a blind person be your traffic reporter on the radio. 
because it's one of those things that people like, how do you do, you can't do that, you've never seen traffic, you don't know what you're talking about. But there's nothing to it. It's, listen, again, it's 1994 is when I started this job. Well, I did in 89 first, and then again in 94 is when I moved. So all I had to do was listen to people on the phones. The cell phone was just starting to come into prominence. We had it where you could call the radio station for free. Boom. Uh, cops on scanners. And then <laughs> you listen to the other radio stations, too, and make sure they don't have anything you don't have. Seriously, I spent a lot of time listening to the other sticks in town just to make sure, you know, because I didn't want them to have some. Or if I had a good one and they didn't have it yet, I always liked that. I always liked that. That was always fun. Um, so that's how I did the traffic. So now I, it's a new job. It's a lot farther away. So now my life is changing. I need to get a ride to this radio station. It starts at 5 o'clock in the morning. The trains don't run. So I asked everybody in the world, all people in my community and stuff, did, would anybody need to make a little extra money, blah, blah, blah. And I finally found somebody who would do it. So it's great. So here I am. I'm at a bigger station now. I'm on a morning show. I'm, I'm a traffic reporter. I'm doing mornings and afternoons, 5 to 9 and 3 to 7. And it's good. I'm with a guy who's hysterically funny. Now, I'm going to go backwards just for a minute here because I just want to remind you that as a blind person, remember, I was always telling you how I was trying to fit in. I always wanted to fit in. So now I'm on the radio fitting in because no one knows I'm a blind person. You see, I went and hid on the radio. And I know, but I did. I hid. And it was great because I could do it just like a sighted person that nobody knew. And it was cool. See, I hated being blind so much. And I hated the word blind. I couldn't even say it. Couldn't even say it. People go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, I, you know what? I just can't see. You know, I couldn't even say the word. It broke my heart. Broke my, it made me nuts. And so now I'm at this job, and I have to spend money to get there. It's a good job. It's nice. It's fun. But I'm not, uh, I'm just not with it. The money is killing me. I have to wait for trains. If any, you know, I have no money left in my pocket after spending money to get back and forth and all this kind of stuff. And I'm depressed. I'm, the most fun I'm having is the eight hours a day I'm on the air. And the rest of the time, I can't stand it. And an old girlfriend of mine said, look, you're all messed up. you got to do something. I said, what? She goes, talk to a therapist. I said, ah, come on. What for? They don't know anything. And she just was on me and on me. And I said, OK, if it's going to make you stop, I'll do it. So <laughs> well, listen, I'm a guy, right? You know how it is. <laughs> Right, fellas? You know. <laughs> if it's going to stop her from doing it, we'll do it. You know. And so it did. And so I went to a therapist. Then we talked and talked and talked for a while. And nothing happened. And I said, you know what? This is Bravo Sierra. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm not getting dinged on code of contact. Not me, baby. <laughs> I love you guys so much. But I did. So I was like, this is Bravo Sierra. It's not working. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sorry, my love. Look, next week, I don't want you to have an empty appointment book, so I'm not coming in next week. And she goes, how come? And I said, well, because I'm going away. She goes, why? And I said, well, I hate being blind. It stinks. I'm done with it. I'm, just, I'm finished. She goes, well, where are you going? I said, I'm, I'm going to kill myself this weekend. Yeah. Like, it sucked. It sucked so much. But... I, I mean, I had the plan all ready to go. And just like a typical psychologist, right? What does she say to me? She goes, well, look, our time's just about up. <laughs> I do have another client waiting. And I was like, ah, oh, you got to be kidding me, lady. Come on. She says, look, just give me 168 hours. Come back next Tuesday. If you still feel the same way, you can do as you'd like the following weekend. And that saved my life. That saved my life. And it's, it's incredible. And so now, you know, and like... As a result, I get to be here with you. So then, you know, I worked radio, and I'm starting to be a, and then I came out. I'll tell you one more little radio story, and then we'll get on to some, like, some technology things, and accessibility and that. But I came out as a blind person on the radio. We had a reporter from one of the newspapers came. We used to do school visits, and we'd bring sound back of the kids saying, good morning, John and Tommy. And it was a chance for the kids to tell their parents to listen to the radio and sort of grow the audience, right? Very sort of ground, ground roots, you know, grassroots, if you will. Um, so a reporter heard what we were doing, liked it, wanted to come out, and went, oh my god, you have a blind traffic reporter. How do you like that? And that was when I came out. So the next morning, this article comes out in the paper, and Harper is like, can I read this on the air? I was like, dude, this is the biggest secret in Connecticut radio. You're blowing up my spot, man. <laughs> He's like, no, dude, I'll do it right. Don't worry about it. I said, OK, and I trust you. And he did. And that was when I came out as a blind person on the radio. And that was the beginning of my life really starting to change in ways that I couldn't even imagine. Um, and it was great. But you see, that was, that was life with no accessibility. So now let me tell you about 
what it's done for me and what it does for me on, on a regular basis. I mean, I bought my first computer in 1997. I got a Performa 6400. Now you're going, why'd you pick a Mac? Why'd you get a Mac? And the Windows people in the house are going, what's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with me. You ready? I could, so remember, it's 1997. IBM's the big, the big dog. The 386 and the 486 are the big machines. So I'm, you know, I called IBM and I said, hi, my name's Tommy. I'm a blind person. I'm blind since birth. I want to get a computer. What would it be? What, you know, what am I going to need to get? Uh, just a moment, please. And I was on hold forever. I was on hold for a long time. And I got, I got tired. I said, let me call Mac. Let me call Apple and see. And I called them. I was like, hey, my name's Tommy. I'm blind since birth, but I need, oh my God, hang on. You need to talk to Steve. Just one second. And I was like, wow, we, this is brilliant. He's like, yeah, get this computer. Back then, there was an old software, uh, software thing called Outspoken that was made by this company up in San Francisco called Alva Graphics. And that was a really primitive screen reader, but it was pretty good. It allowed me to use the machine. And that was how I started, you know, and that was the first real accessible thing I ever had. When I was a kid, accessibility, I had a talking calculator. I think that was about the only thing. And then, you know, everything else was Braille. Nothing talked, just this calculator. And I do a lot of math computations. But, uh, but now, I, I, I'll never forget the first, so 2009, so that's 97. So I'm using computers now for a long time. And I have access to things I've never had access to before, like music charts, you know, credits for things, credits for films, credits for albums, credit, you know, all sorts of things, and news, and all just, I, it, the world was big wide open for me. I couldn't believe it. Then in 2009, I got my first iPhone. And I'll never forget coming home from the store. I was so excited. And then I opened the box and went, oh, stupid, what'd you do? What? This is a piece of glass with three buttons on it. You're an idiot. You're never going to work this. <laughs> Go get your money back, dummy. <laughs> but I, I was just slow. I was just real slow with it and just learned how to do one thing at a time. I learned how to make a phone call. I was like, I need to make a phone call first. Let's learn that. Then I learned how to text. Then I learned how to play a song, you know, and all the different things. And you just, it's a growing experience. It can be very daunting, but it's incredible. And that was, you know, that was the old 3GS. And I'm telling you what, the iPhone is incredible. I don't know how I live without it. Um, and the things that it gives me access to. I, when I was living in L.A., I lived in L.A. for about a year and a half. I lived in Santa Monica. We went out to do some movie reviews and stuff and then do some more work on the YouTube channel. Um, and when I first got there, I was in an Airbnb. I was all by myself. Nobody. And I said, I'm bored. i got to go out in the world. <laughs> so I got walking directions. I found the nearest sort of place for breakfast or brekkie. And I got walking directions to it on the phone and had the phone in my pocket and just listened to it talk to me. And I did pretty good. I took a couple of trees in the face. You know, I did. I took one good tree in the face because, you know, they're in the sidewalk in LA. You know how it is. So I'm in this restaurant. I'm like, are you a mom? She goes, yeah. I said, look at this. Am I too badly? She goes, nah, you're fine. You'll be great. Don't worry about a thing. I was like, cool, thank you. But, you know, the things that are happening for access. So one of the things that people talk about accessibility. How am I doing on time? Am I good? All right, I'm just prattling here, so just don't mind me. But one of the things that people talk a lot about accessibility is that it stands in the way of innovation. And again, say it with me, bravo Sierra. It's not true. It's not true. Look, if you build something and then try to bolt accessibility onto it last minute, it ain't going to work. Right? It's not going to work. But if you do it like Apple did and build it in from the ground, it's going to work all the time. So I started taking Instagram pictures. I love Instagram. Instagram is awesome. And I take pictures. I just put the phone up and just take a shot. And you guys tell me what it is. And that's the fun of it. <laughs> but it's true. You, obviously, you've never seen my Instagram feed. The Instagram feed, you must check it out. It's brilliant. It's, it's great. And they're all photos I've taken myself, all of them, except the photos of, my, of me. Uh, you, know, not the, you can tell the difference between selfie and the rest, right? So you know. Um, but they're all photos I've taken. But so Instagram. Got, they were into it. They're like, this is great. We want to do a story on you. I said, cool, thank you very much. And then they updated. And they broke it. <laughs> it was broke. It's, it wasn't accessible anymore. So I said, well, I can't do the story until y'all fix it. So eight months later, Christmas time, they fixed it. And then we did the story in January. And so you see, a thing I was using, and then they did the update, and it broke. So I, I'm telling you, man, except another, uh, there's, there's a guy up in San Diego named Suman Kemoganti who's created a product called Ira for the blind and visually impaired. And it is a pair of smart glasses. And you put your headphones on, and you keep your phone in your pocket, 
and there's a lens on the side of the glasses over here, and it's watching. So they can watch you walk through. So here's the demo for this product, okay? In San Diego, I've never been there before. The guy, I've, I've got the thing on, and I'm talking to this woman. I don't know where she is, but she's around. It's okay, we're gonna go to uh, Starbucks. I said, okay, cool. She goes, uh, just walk, the, you know, take out, take out your stick and walk through the building. We're going to the elevator, down to the street. We're gonna cross two streets into Starbucks. She walked me up to the counter, told me when it was my turn to order, order my tea, and then got me into a table, all without the help of a single-sided person, just this one in, the, in this thing, right? And that's the kind of stuff people are coming up with. Like, that's the future. It's, you know, people talk about the, the autonomous car, and I'm scared to death of it. I am. You know what freaks me out about those cars, first off? They don't make any noise. They don't make noise. So there's, there's a couple of crossings where I live in Connecticut where I have to be very careful. And, I, like, I've walked into the sides of cars because they'll be just stopped and it doesn't make any noise. So it's, like, it's weird. But the autonomous one, I don't know. I, that just sort of scares me. I don't think I want somebody, you know, I'd rather have a human drive me around. Thank you. But that's, that's just me. That's just me. But there you go. So that's, you know, some of the accessibility stuff. And then, you know, just, you know, YouTube was a, a great ride, too. YouTube has been, so, you're thinking like a blind person on YouTube? What? You're kidding me. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, how does that work? <laughs> how do you make, <laughs> people always ask me, how do you edit your videos, man? I'm like, man, somebody edits them for me. Come on, I'm not editing video. Like, please, I can barely edit audio. <laughs> but um, YouTube was great. So we, we, my friend Ben Churchill and I, I still got what, like 10 minutes? Yep. Okay. We'll do, we'll do this story, and then we'll do some Q&A. How's that sound? Everybody like? Because this is a fun story. This, this is one of my favorites. So I was always afraid of the camera, always scared to death of the camera, because I don't know what it is. I don't know how I look. You know what I mean? So I never wanted to be on camera. There are a lot of pictures of me as a child. Um, and then we get this idea to do YouTube videos. So we're sitting around the house drinking beer on a Monday night, as we do. I only have to get up for work at 3. It's a difference. <laughs> What are you going to do? But I have all the time during the day to nap, right? So it's all good. So we're talking. I had just seen some movie, and I was complaining about it because the last little bit of the film, all the resolution was done without words. So I didn't know what happened to all these characters that I've been following the whole time. This is without audio description. So I was like, what a piece of garbage. Blah, 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 blah. Ben's like, well, why don't we, do, you know, why don't we start doing movie reviews from your point of view? I was like, yeah, that'll be fun. People have never seen this. So we called it the Blind Film Critic. And we went and saw Scream 4 on a Thursday night. I went to work Friday morning. Ben went and posted. The, he, he's like, listen, dude, I don't know if this even got to see the light of day, but I'll go home and put it together and see what we got. And sure enough, it did see the light of day. He put it up Friday afternoon. Monday, something started to happen. Something, ha something happened on Monday. I got a call from the Laszlo show in Kansas City. He's like, hey, we saw what you're doing on the, on the YouTubes. Do you want to come on the radio with us? I was like, well, sure. I, I, why not? So that was the first bit of press. Then I went home on the Monday night. I was like, Ben, you've got to come over. It's, something's happening. And we're sitting around watching the internet, and Roger Ebert tweets out my review of Scream 4. And that's really nice praise. Now, for the young people, who, who's Roger Ebert, man? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Roger Ebert was part of a film, um, a film review show, him and his partner Gene Siskel. And they were on television for years and years and years. They're giant stars in that, in that field. So um, to, get, to get bigged up from him was incredible. And then from there, we went on to do, because people were asking a lot of questions about my life and how it worked and stuff in the comment section. So we started the Tommy Edison XP channel and, and did videos about my life and answered questions like, does it bother you that you don't know what you look like? Do you use the lights when you're at home alone? Um, yeah. I mean, how do you know when to stop wiping in the bathroom? I mean, ridiculous. But these are things that people were curious about. And so we answered them. And it was very successful. We had a nice, we had a nice run on YouTube. Now, real quick, I'll just tell you what. So people always ask me on the radio and on YouTube, they always, how can you be so happy all the time? How are you so happy? I said, look, happiness is a choice. My blindness is a choice. I didn't choose blindness for a lot of my life. I did not choose it. I was a victim, you see? And when you choose something, it works different. So when you choose to be happy, it's nice. Yeah? When you choose to have fun, I choose to have fun every single day of my life because it might be the last, and I don't want to miss that. World Trade blew my mind, because people at 8.46 in the morning had died, and I'm sure that there were people that morning who never smiled or even laughed. Imagine, and I never want to go out like that. So 
you know, it's, it's all about a choice. And the thing that I learned, really, that it would sort of tie this all together for you in, in a nice, neat little bunch, um, in order for me to really get to know myself and get to be my full potential, I had to be with myself. And that was scary as Foxtrot. It was, man. I didn't want to. And you know what's great? The word that almost killed me is now the thing that's the first part of my name. So... It's pretty good. So thank you very much. If, there's, if anybody has any questions at all, we got a couple of minutes. So I'd love to. I'd, I'd love doing Q and A. So I'm sure we can get somebody to run around with a microphone if we'd like. Um, so if there's something you'd like to know, what? I've got the accent on the wrong syllable. It's the Greek god of uh, audio, microphone. Huh? <laughs> Nothing. Is this thing even on? <laughs> I was telling somebody before. I asked a friend of mine who's a chef what he makes when he's drunk, and he said about twelve fifty an hour. <laughs> Any questions? The first one's always tough. The next couple are easy, but the first one's kind of tough. But we'll see. If not, I can stand here and tell jokes for a minute and then say goodbye. Have you got one? Yeah. Hey, uh, so your name is Tommy Edison. Yes, sir. There's some other guy I know the name, Thomas Edison. He's an inventor. Yes, sir. Uh, is there anything that you would like invented either for you or just to invent? You know, that's a wonderful question. You know what I'd like? I'd like to be able to use... Um, my cable box. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to use the cable box. I can't watch on demand. I can't watch pay per view. I can't uh, use the DVR. I can't set up, you know, a pro, you know, something to put on a schedule to record or whatever. So I just don't watch terribly much telly. But yeah, I would like something like that. But you know, I can find everything on YouTube. So I really kind of almost don't need telly anymore. But I, I think that's something I, that I would like invented because I think, and I know that. Uh, um, who is it? Comcast is working um, to do a, a nice cable box. Um, but mine up in Connecticut is just the worst. It's so, I can't even, oh, 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 you'll love this. I can't even get to, um, you know the way they offer that Wi-Fi to go, right? You know, on, on the back of people's, you know, houses, you know, it emits a signal and stuff so you can use the Wi-Fi and stuff. I can't even get onto it. It's completely inaccessible. Totally inaccessible. They're accessible for Android phones, but not for iPhones. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, what are the biggest challenges as you're browsing the internet? <laughs> What's uh, annoying? <laughs> image, 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 image. When people don't label their photos, uh, or people don't label their buttons, button, 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 it'll say. And it's like, what? what? So what, am I supposed to try all three and just see what happens? <laughs> because that's invariably what I have to do, honestly. And I will try all three. And I'm waiting for one day for like, you know, remember Daffy Duck about, don't hit the wet button, not the wet button. Um, but yeah, that's, I find it very frustrating when people don't label their things on, on, on websites and stuff. Or, um, you know, when, or the other thing on the phone too, sometimes they'll put the next button in a place and they'll be so teeny tiny. And you can, or the done button is teeny tiny, and you can't find it. But yeah, those are a couple of my biggest gripes. Oh, we got one more. Uno más. I got one. Don't do it in Spanish, I'll be screwed. My Spanish isn't that good, I just have the accent. <laughs> so you've obviously turned this weakness into a strength for you that's kind of become part of your character, but I'm sure you still deal with discouragements. So how do you approach that? Like, what's the best tool that you have for fighting those discouragements when they come up in your life? Laughter. Laughter and fun. You can't. I mean, look, sometimes I get, I get angry and I get, you mother father, and you know, this and that. <laughs> but it's really, it's about, you know, you just have to keep a sense of humor. So I'll tell you one quick story. Ready for a frustrating little fun story? So I live, I live in a place called Milford, Connecticut. I've lived there for 16 years. It's a lovely little place. If any of y'all want to come and visit, just you know, hit me up and we'll set something up. And you, you know, because it's a great neighborhood, good pizza, fun. It's nice. A lot of bars and stuff. It's a nice time. So I'm a taxpayer there for 16 years. I own a home. Okay. <laughs> this year, I, I went to go pay my taxes, and somebody in front of me was like, "And I need a beach pass." I was like, "Well, shoot, I want a beach pass." So I said, "I want a beach pass too." And they're like, "Well, sure. Where's your car registered?" I said, "What car?" Well, you need a car in order to get a beach pass. I said, what? I've been living here all this time and I can't get a bloody beach pass? No, nope, no beach pass for you. Wow, can you imagine? 
So somebody who buys some piece of garbage car for $300 and registers it in Milford can get a beach pass, but I, as a homeowner, cannot. Yeah, I think that's kind of nutty, too. But there you go. So that's one of my biggest frustrations. And, you know, just like, like that, that, that was like, Ugh! but I couldn't do anything, so I just had to have a laugh about it. I mean, because I could scream and yell at people, but what's it going to get me? Nothing. Then people are just going to think I'm a creep, so... I, but it's true. So you have a laugh about it, and then you plan a strategy. So I'm contacting my alderman, and we're going to fix this. So that's what you do. Well, look, you guys, thank you. So this has been great fun. Did you have a nice time? Was this all right? Yeah. yeah? Are we okay? You guys are the greatest, man. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the conference.